Okay, I think we can start. Good morning to everyone. Uh, this is uh, the second day, the plenary talk. I am Marco Lauricella and uh, I will share the plenary talk now and then uh, the session, third session in the room Leone. Okay, to, today it's a pleasure to present you Benedict Dorschner. He is a, a senior scientist uh, at the Swiss Federal in Institute of uh, Technology in uh, Zurich. Uh, he uh, focuses his uh, attention in general on complex flows, uh, working in uh, particular by the lattice bo bo Boltzmann uh, in the entropic fa fashion. And uh, his uh, interest uh, re ranging from uh, uh, different uh, uh, aspects of the fluid di dynamics, in uh, particular, uh, also including uh, uh, incompressible tu turbulence, fluid structure interaction, thermal and uh, compressible high speed flows. Uh, he is uh, also the de de developer of uh, se several codes. And uh, the presentation of uh, today is particles on the demand modeling of high speed com compressible flows. So please. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to be able to speak to you here today. Uh, sadly, not yet in person, but no, <laughs> we'll make the best out of it. Um, so, as you mentioned, um, today I want to talk to you a bit about how we can model high-speed compressible flows um, using particles on demand. Um, this is uh, under the scope of an ERC project um, led by Ilya. And what I will be showing you today is not just uh, my work, but um, has been contributed by, by many PhD students uh, as listed here, also postdocs. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so, let me start by um, giving you a bit of an overview, I think we can now all agree that LBM really has developed into a versatile computational method, um, ranging from turbulent flows where, you know, up, uh, up at the development of uh, more sophisticated uh, collision operators, we really were able to extend the range of attainable Reynolds numbers um, that we can look at and really have a predictive tool. The same applies in the um, multi-phase flow regime, I think there also LBM has really developed into a tool which can be used to not just validate, but also really understand and analyze uh, complex flows. Uh, another area where I'm recently becoming interested is in is reactive flows. And also there, I think we, we can make a valuable contribution. However, now the talk uh, is about compressible flows. And I think particularly in the recent years, there's been a lot of developments how we can uh, use LBM also in this regime. And here I want to show you the range of Mach numbers here by this error that you can see. And I think so far we have um, con been conquering somehow the, the, the far left side. So we can do incompressible turbulence. And um, there's also a uh, scope for, um, for using LBM in the transonic regime and also in the in the supersonic regime, but this is still limited to the mild supersonic regime. So, so still quite low Mach numbers. And today I wanted to talk to you basically about the full range of Mach numbers. And in particular, there's a lot of interest uh, these days in hypersonic flight. So there we of course then need a tool um, how to accurately predict hypersonic flow. And this somewhere starts around Mach 8 um, and then leads to hypervelocity flow. And there's very interesting applications um, such as atmospheric re-entry, uh, which ranges about Mach numbers 20, 30, something like that. But even further, if you go in Mach up to 1000 and beyond, you have interesting applications in astrophysics. So there's an um, astrophysical jet that you um, uh, want to predict numerically and understand and analyze it for. But now let's talk about a bit about the problem that we are um, having in really solving um, compressible high-speed flows. And this starts by looking at 
the Boltzmann equation in its continuous form. And um, here you can see it's, it's continuous in velocity space and we have our Maxwell Boltzmann distribution function. We know that if we take and uh, do a chapman ansbach analysis, we can recover the fully compressible Fourier Navier-Stokes equation as shown here by looking or considering the moments, these five moments that I'm showing here. So that is our conservation loss, that's the pressure tensor, uh, heat flux tensor, and the fourth order moment that we need to uh, consider in order to get the fully compressible Navier-Stokes equation. Now that becomes a bit tricky if you look at the at the discrete setting, right? So this is the lattice Boltzmann equation can be viewed as a discrete version of the Boltzmann equation. So here um, we also discretize the velocity space here denoted by CI. And then of course, we also need to construct somehow a discrete version of the equilibrium distribution function. And the requirements to really get to the fully compressible Fourier Navier-Stokes equation is that we have to recover these five moments correctly. And this becomes of course a bit tricky if you only have a finite set um, available and um, it becomes clear if you al already look at our standard lattices. So here in one dimension is D1Q3. So this is a, a particle's velocity at rest, minus one and plus one. And of course, if you go to higher dimensions, you can take the tensor product and you will end up uh, with these lattices. But then of course, if you take higher order moments, you can see that here, CI cube is gonna be CI. And this implies that the moments are gonna be linearly dependent. Thus, we cannot capture all the moments that we previously said that we need to recover in order to go to uh, high speed flows. Um, and you can somehow quantify this, this error that you're committing uh, by looking at the deviations from the uh, discrete moments to the continuous Maxwell Boltzmann counterparts. Here I uh, show some errors where, uh, or specific errors. Um, they of course depend a bit on the choice of the equilibria, but the, but the main structure remains very similar. In particular, you have these errors in the Q moment and in the R moment, so the fourth order moment and the third order moment. If you look now here, you have a term which is um, linear in the velocity and cubic in velocity. Then you can say, okay, let's fix a temperature that will kill the linear term. So a fixed reference temperature here at one third, this will nullify this term, but you're still left with a term which is cubic in velocity. And similar considerations also apply to the fourth order moment. And thus you can somehow say that um, these errors will only be negligible if you have vanishing flow velocity due to the cubic term here and a fixed reference temperature T zero. Of course, there have been many developments on how to circumvent this, how to mitigate these errors, how to live with them. Um, and I list here a couple of them. So the first route would be to say, okay, if we need to match higher order moments correctly, let's increase the number of speeds that we are tracking. And this led to the development of uh, multi-speed lattices X, as shown here exemplarily uh, in this picture. The other route you can say is like, okay, these multi-speed lattices, lattices are bulky. They are, hard to deal with, let's stick with the standard lattices, but look at the errors that we're actually committing and uh, counteract them already in the kinetic equations by introducing some correction terms. Of course, there's also hybrid models where you say, okay, let's, let's solve the energy equation, for example, um, with a different method. Um, so finite volume, finite difference um, approaches exist there as well. And of course, then there's particles on demand, uh, which I will present to you in a bit of detail today, um, which is trying to describe the particle distribution functions with respect to a local reference frame, thereby eliminating these Galilean invariants from the start. But let's look a bit in the higher order lattices and actually what they can do. Um, and the first thing you need, of course, is a tool in order to systematically increase your number of discrete speeds. Most naturally, you would look at um, higher order Hermit polynomials and really use the roots of these Hermit polynomials for your discretization of the particle's velocity space. Here I pasted uh, a table which um, reports basically the, um, the first couple of orders of Hermit polynomials and the corresponding roots as shown here. You can see that uh, here the D1Q3 is recovered. Um, uh, and um, this is actually can be scaled such that we uh, have a space filling uh, uniform lattice. However, if you go to higher order, this will not be the case anymore and you will um, have to um, use some off-lattice uh, propagation schemes. 
there's of course another avenue um, where you can consider also entropy. And this led to um, somehow a set of admissible lattices, um, basically supporting a positive and real reference temperature. And um, this is now on lattice. And I, I show you here examples of the first couple of orders of velocity sets that you can have here in one dimension. Of course, something else you need to consider is now how would you construct equilibria for these higher order lattices? And there exists also a couple of, um, of possibilities. You can again look at your um, permit polynomial expansion. Um, that's one way. You can directly invert, invert the moment system that you're looking at. That's yet another one. And then finally, you can also say, okay, let's um, look at a, a discrete um, H function and um, minimize this H function subject to um, some uh, constraints. And this will also lead to a discrete um, numerical equilibrium. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we have a closure. And of course, if you have a multi-speed lattices, this closure will also be pushed to higher order um, as, as shown here. And of course, this will then also affect the reference temperature that you're dealing with. Now let's look at a bit of the accuracy of, of these, these type of schemes. And um, here I show you the deviations of the um, uh, heat flux in the fourth order moment with respect to the um, Maxwell-Boltzmann counterpart. And you can readily see here, this is, this is the error in terms of advection Mach number. And you can see that um, if you increase the advection num uh, Mach number, the error will increase irrespective of the uh, lattice that you're choosing. However, the error will uh, be smaller if you're choosing a higher order velocity set. But the higher you go in the order, the more uh, or the less errors you have if you increase your Mach number. But you can already see that it's quite of a slow increase. In particular, if you look at uh, Mach number one, so you want supersonic flow, you already need um, 49 velocity lattice in two dimensions. And um, that is, of course, uh, kind of a slow increase. Now, similar picture arises if you look at the temperature deviations. And here, the, this is shown at, uh, with a theta here. So theta zero corresponds to the reference temperature. And if you deviate from that, you can see in these two plots that um, the error you will accumulate errors as well. It, it gets even worse if you superimpose a, a local advection mark number, and then these errors will rise as well. You can also look at now positivity ranges of these equilibria. And um, here I show a table of the uh, temperature ranges that you can actually achieve with these lattices. And by temperature ranges, I mean, those are the temperatures um, that, you, that you can have where the weights, which are now temperature dependent, are still positive. You can see that in the standard lattice, it actually supports an infinite range uh, of temperatures between zero and one. But if you go higher in order, this ratio actually decreases uh, quite rapidly. Thus posing the question, if it's really the way forward to really large Mach number flows, because if I increase the velocity set, um, I will diminish the temperature range that, can, that, that I can actually accommodate in this lattice. However, you can do something. And uh, here I show you simulations from Nikolov Rapoli. He was um, uh, doing a, a lot of simulation and they actually have shown to be very accurate. So if these schemes work, they're very accurate. He was simulating here um, a transonic airfoil. Um, and he computed uh, also quantities like the pressure coefficient and compared it with DNS. And it was actually quite an accurate match even for quite under-resolved simulations. He also did um, supersonic flow simulations uh, here shown exemplarily with this supersonic doubled cone. And again, we could compare it with an analytical solution. And you can see that um, even with quite coarse resolution, um, you were able to capture everything quite accurately within an error of 1%. So you can do something, um, but as I mentioned earlier, now we have to um, see what we can do. So higher order lattices work. They can increase the range of attainable Mach number. It's a slow increase though. And actually the temperature range decreases with an increasing number of velocities. So that somehow questions if this, is, this alone um, is a path towards very large Mach numbers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can say, okay, let's ditch higher order lattices. Um, and let's stick to standard lattices uh, and then correct the terms that we actually, uh, or the error terms um, in the hydrodynamic limit, correct them directly in the kinetic equations. 
And here I show you again the errors that we are committing, um, just to remind. And um, now we've been working on that, uh, which is called an extended lattice Boltzmann uh, method. And this is basically aiming to correct these errors. So you can do this by um, realizing that you can actually um, uh, correct these errors when you impose different pressure tensor. And this is now not just the equilibrium pressure tensor that we usually have, but also takes into account uh, the derivative of the deviation of the third order moment. Um, and you can impose that by uh, moment inversion is one way, or you can write it as I show here more compactly um, as a product form equilibrium, uh, where it's a product of these of these triplets here. So that's that, that's one part for the third order moment. Um, you also have to look at the fourth order moment and the heat flux itself. Um, and here you can also impose it directly, in the sense that. Here we look at the, uh, the, the moments of the maxwell boltzmann energy distribution functions use a second population in order to impose that. And um, here you can realize that um, you can generate these moments with these operators as shown here. And then if you replace the energy coming from this uh, maxwell boltzmann with a more generic energy, uh, then uh, you can compute your moments, impose them correctly, again, via moment inversion slash uh, the operator product form as shown here. And then actually all the moments that you impose will be recovered correctly. Now, um, that is actually works. I want to show you um, very briefly a simulation of, of Fosse and Salat, who actually will have a talk later on and discuss this in a bit more detail. Um, and this was a, um, the simulation of decaying compressible homogeneous isotropic turbulence. So Reynolds number is 175 and turbulent Mach of roughly 0.5. Um, so that's a complex flow because you have turbulence, but you also have local supersonic regions, so-called eddy shocklets, as you can see here, uh, by looking at isosurface of velocity divergence and then colored by uh, local Mach number. And you can see here that it actually goes up to 1.4 locally. So there you again have to capture on, on one hand, you need an accurate scheme not to kill all the turbulence, but you also need to be stable enough in order to uh, capture the shocks. And he was able to compare uh, now statistics with, uh, low, uh, with DNS simulations. So here shown by the dissipation rate, uh, as well as the um, Reynolds number based on the Taylor microscale with time. And you can see that actually um, these schemes are quite accurate and can be used to uh, simulate these type of flows. Now, what I've shown you so far, so these schemes are very comfortable in the regime um, that I've been showing previously. So this is in the, in the, in the range of uh, transonic mild supersonic flows. I promised you to go a bit further to look at the upper range uh, and um, for this, I will introduce particles on demand. Um, I will start by reminding again that lattice Boltzmann itself can be considered um, as uh, describing the uh, particle distribution functions of populations with respect to the laboratory reference frame. That means zero velocity and a fixed reference temperature. So that, that leads to uh, the fact that the peculiar velocities are gonna be your discrete velocities and you're gonna be having a stencil looking like that throughout your domain fixed and constant. As I've previously shown you that this uh, will lead to some, some errors and you will go into some trouble if you simply increase the Mach number. However, in particles on demand or pond, you say, okay, let's, let's, let's find a way how to describe these populations with respect to the local reference frame. But this is now depending on the local flow velocity and the local temperature. And then you simply have to rescale your populations accordingly and shift it by the local uh, flow velocities. And this, of course, will then lead to uh, lattices, which will be uh, spatially varying, as shown here, depending on local flow conditions. What you will get, however, is full Galilean invariance. That means what this local reference frame actually implies is that, that the populations only see macroscopic quantities with respect to the local gauge. That means in your, your equilibrium, for example, will be evaluated at zero velocity and the reference temperature directly, basically uh, leading to just the density dependence times the weights. And now it also implies if you take the moments now here with these scaled and shifted velocities, 
um, with respect to some reference frame, um, you will actually um, recover all the moments that you will actually need in order to uh, recover fully compressible Navier Stokes. So all the troubles that we had before will vanish once I'm in the local reference frame. Now the question comes, how would you, would you do that? How would you um, be able to describe these populations in a local reference frame? And for this, we need a tool to, to map from one reference frame, let's say here at rest, to a um, local reference frame. And in part we say, let's, let's match the moments. And we say all the moments should be equivalent in independent of the reference frame I'm choosing. And you can write this out as shown here. Um, you can invert the system and you will end up with a transformation matrix here, chi, which will map populations from a reference frame lambda to lambda prime. And this transformation always exists. Now, the kinematic equations, they actually don't differ that much. So you have your uh, collision term shown here. Now, the equilibrium, as I said earlier, becomes trivial. So um, that's a benefit. On the other hand, um, the propagation will be a bit more tricky. Tricky, why? Because these discrete velocity speeds will depend on space and time, right? So there, we necessarily require an off-lattice propagation scheme. And I introduce here really a generic way how to reconstruct these populations with some interpolation functions. That's not necessarily important right now. And what's important is to note that here we need to transform these populations to the given gauge or reference frame in the monitoring point where I'm trying to reconstruct. Now, um, what's important to realize is that the characteristics still remain constant. So there is no derivative of sorts of these discrete speeds. That's simply because conceptually, you can think of this as transform uh, transforming the entire computational domain into the reference frame you want, doing your propagation transform back. However, of course, in the, in the discrete setting, you don't have to do that um, because the advection procedure will only concern a small region around the monitoring point, nearest neighbors or, or one beyond. So, now the question is, how do we get this um, local reference frame, right? So we know that once we are in the local reference frame, everything is well behaved and, and works well. The question is how to get there. And we get there by an, by an iterative a predictor corrector search. Basically, we initialize the system with previous time step values. We can thus compute our discrete velocities, um, do an off lattice propagation of sorts. Uh, compute macroscopic fields um, because they are now new because you have uh, you have distributed um, your mass, momentum, energy, and so on, um, which then necessarily leads to a new reference frame. And then you have to check if you have converged. And by converged, mean did the reference frame change? If it has changed, you keep iterating until it converges. And once it converges, you're actually in the local reference frame and you can carry out your collision and the next time step. Here's a note on, on, on the conversions of this whole thing. It's a somehow a fast convergence in the sense that uh, typically we don't require much more than one iteration in, in regions where you have smooth flow um, and only at, um, uh, in regions where you have large gradients, discontinuities, there you will have iterations which go beyond one, but still kind of small. They're, they range between four, five, six, something around that. So that this thing actually works and this fully Galilean invariant, I want to show with them basic validations. And here I plot the uh, viscosity and its dependence on the advection Mach number. So physically, of course, this should not affect it, but you can see if you use a normal LBGK um, uh, model, then, then you will have the spurious dependence um, of the viscosity on the Mach number. If you use pond on the other hand, this does not happen even for different temperatures that you're gonna be imposing. The same thing appears if you look at the, um, the speed of sound. So you, we know that if you just use a normal LBGK, you will only be correct at a singular point that is the reference temperature and every, everything deviating from that will lead to an error. 
However, in pond, you can actually recover a wide range of temperatures, even if you superimpose an advection Mach number of, of year 100, it doesn't really matter, it will, it will fully recover your correct speed of sound. Uh, more pictorially, you can look at the vortex spring, which is now advected um, in the flow. And you can see that if you use uh, LBGK, you will have some spurious deformations once you increase the advection Mach number. In pond, however, it actually remains round and no deformation because you're fully Galilean invariant and you can even go up to Mach numbers of 100. It doesn't really matter. Uh, previously, um, I was a bit vague about the choice of the off lattice propagation scheme. And, and that was for a reason because there are many um, different methods that you can use and you can more or less generically um, uh, incorporate pond in them. So previously we've been using a similar Lagrangian advection scheme, um, which uh, works, but also has some drawbacks, especially if you use um, uh, Lagrange polynomials or something like that. Um, I encourage you to check out a bit uh, Nikos Kalkunis' talk. Um, he will talk about uh, finite volume schemes um, because there's the main benefit that you uh, rigorously conserve mass. And on the duck side, of course, um, you can get away with much less velocities. But you can also use uh, finite different streams. You can uh, use hybrid schemes, LBM, pond. You can snap them into the lattice uh, if, if the flow actually um, uh, allows that. There's also other approximate versions like regularizations uh, and so on. Um, in terms of the reconstructions themselves, we've been also playing with um, moment conserving interpolations that we borrowed from uh, the vortex particle community but also higher order Venus schemes, limiters, and so on. So those really help if you really go to large Mach numbers with a strong discontinuity. Uh, and for those schemes, Esan will also talk, I think in the next talk, uh, a little bit more in detail on the, on the numerics. Okay, so now um, one other thing to note is that um, Pond is quite universal in the sense that we can use all the, all the different models that we have already developed in LBM uh, within Pond. So we can use our two population models, quasi-equilibrium models. Uh, you can also um, use your favorite multi-phase model, multi-speed models for non-equilibrium flows, uh, and even detonation simulations are now possible. And in the following, I want to show you a bit what you can do with those. So I will, I will start with 1D cases, um, hard 1D cases, um, because you will first need to capture really strong discontinuities. In 1D, if you can do that, then the extension to 2 and 3D is, is rather, rather straightforward. So, and the first thing I'm gonna show is uh, that of a shock density wave interaction. So you have a shock wave of Mach 3, which will be interacting with a sine wave in density. Uh, and we did this with a uh, two population model using uh, nine speeds. Uh, and we compared this with a higher order um, Dino uh, finite difference scheme. And you can see that actually Pond is able to recover um, what the DNS produces. So um, this is actually a quite sensitive test case uh, because these oscillations are very tricky to capture accurately in terms of uh, phase and magnitude. So here we're quite happy, but this is still kind of a mild shock, right? So that's Mach 3, um, but let's go a bit further. Uh, and here I want to show you um, the setup of a strong shock tube. And by strong, I mean, it is, it is strong in terms of the pressure ratios. Um, so we, here we have a pressure ratio of uh, 10 to the five, so five orders of magnitude difference. That's, that's far beyond what you uh, typically see like saw shock tubes and so on. So this is much higher, which leads somehow to an apparent Mach of roughly 200. Uh, but of course it's a nice setup because we have an analytical solution. And this is what I'm showing here is the comparison in terms of pressure and velocity uh, with uh, the exact solution and pond. You can see actually the dynamics is captured quite well. You have some small oscillations, but um, this is um, of course uh, somewhat normal and depends also on the reconstruction scheme and also all the classical solvers will exhibit these type of uh, behavior. Um, another regime that we looked at was compressible multi-phase flows. And here also Pond or um, the whole uh, ideology behind it is, is nice because it lets you impose the non-ideal gas pressure directly by scaling the um, discrete velocity CI here, and then again shifting. Of course, all the surface tension effects and so on uh, will have to be imposed as usual. 
here this was a simulation of, of Essan, um, who was also able to compare um, with experiment uh, by looking at the droplet centerline with evolution. So, um, and he did this for uh, a few Mach numbers and was actually getting quite a good agreement with the experiments. Then we also looked at non-equilibrium flows. And this was a simulation of Nikos, uh, who was looking at a one-dimensional planar shockwave of Mach 1.6. And of course, we know the continuum uh, Fourier Navier Stokes equation will fail um, because you have non equilibrium effects. And um, that's why we also here uh, did simulations using a multi speed lattice. Um, he actually did something more sophisticated in the sense that uh, he used multi scale approach where you, know, you have different lattices and different regions of the flow depending on the local Knudsen number criterion. That's, that, that's not necessarily the point here. The point here is that um, you can actually capture quite accurately uh, non-equilibrium effects uh, with, with pond and the multi-speed lattices. So those are not necessarily um, um, uh, counterintuitive, so you can really combine them as well. Um, the last 1D setup that I wanted to show was that of a one-dimensional detonation. Um, this was a simulation carried out by Nilesh. And uh, here we use a very simple phenomenological model. Uh, here solving simply a, a convection reaction equation and then based on a simplified lee tarver model um, as shown here, where you have a threshold temperature which basically activates uh, your reaction. And then you can um, add the temperature change due to this reaction as a source term in your, in your energy equation or the population for the energy. And this is also a nice setup in the sense that you can compare with an analytical um, solution, uh, which exists at these uh, Ch Ch chapman yugi points where detonation basically propagates at sonic speed with respect to the leading shock wave. And he was doing that for various uh, heats here, basically changing the Mach number. And he was comparing up to Mach number of seven uh, with um, the theory. And as you can see, it's actually a quite a good match uh, and the same goes for the temperature. So we can capture these type of flows quite accurately with pond even for large Mach numbers uh, as shown here up to Mach seven. So this is promising if you now want to go to a more, more complex systems in two dimensions and three dimensions and look at uh, detonation there. Um, last but not least, I promised you the full range and here I want to show you um, somehow an astrophysical jet at a very large Mach number. So you have a chat which, which comes in at Mach number 1000. And um, this was a simulation and still using uh, nine speeds and two populations. It's extreme in the sense that you have an extreme uh, pressure ratio. So the ratio goes up to five orders of magnitude difference or uh, and in both pressure and also temperature. And here in this, in this movie, I show you the evolution of uh, uh, the logarithmic density. Um, I will not go too much in detail there. I think Essan will talk a bit more about what you can actually see here, but this is just to say that uh, Pond also works for extreme Mach number flows. Um, that comes to uh, the end of my talk now. So what I was trying to convey today is that you, uh, a couple of ways how you can do compressible flows uh, with, with LBM or, or kinetic schemes in general. Um, if you look at high order lattices, correction models, they are very accurate, very efficient, but they're somehow limited in the range they can achieve. So you are somehow on the low Mach number end um, of the spectrum and you can use pond to eliminate these Galilean invariants and actually uh, capture the full range in Mach numbers. And this of course opens up very interesting perspectives. We can now look at things uh, like atmospheric reentry problems. Of course, we still have a lot to do in order to capture those accurately, but um, at least there's a, a path towards this now. Also interesting uh, applications like uh, the supersonic parachutes that you will find um, for mass landings, for example. This is something uh, which interests me at the moment and in particular, because we can now use all the knowledge that we are already have from the Lattice Boltzmann in terms of fluid structure and the action uh, and, um, and so on directly into Pond and um, yeah. And then basically tackle these type of applications with that. Um, with this, I would like to thank you and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, 
really interesting pre presentation. Uh, we, we see if uh, we have a question in the chat. It's a bit long, but <laughs> I don't know if you can read uh, directly. It's the first. Uh, as a general comment, it is very surprising to see that you are not talking about efficiency of the proposed approach while it is the only things that matter science. Okay, so I don't necessarily think, um, so efficiency is obviously a concern typically. Um, I don't think that that, um, that matters too much. At the, at the first step we want a solver which can actually go there where we want to go. So I think we want to explore the full range of Mac. And um, of course, um, if you still keep the kinetic part of all these things, then um, you already gain something, right? Um, in terms of non-equilibrium flows, multi-phase flows, and so on and so forth. And um, of course, you can optimize this as well. I mean, um, the, the off-lattice propagation is, is not necessarily the most efficient one, but that is true. But as I mentioned previously, you can combine them uh, with um, LB itself. You can have somehow a discrete um, reference frame um, space, which then um, mitigates the cost of all these transformations, uh, all these iterations and so on. So I think there in terms of optimization, you can do quite a bit and um, that's not necessarily of concern here. And I don't think necessarily that DVMs and ducks and so on are orthogonal to the concept uh, of what I'm presenting here. On the contrary, you can actually you know, incorporate them into pond and vice versa, which will lead for ducks, for example, to a conservative scheme but also reduce the number of velocities that uh, ducks would need in general, right? And the same goes for DVM. DVM I, is- I'm, so, I'm sorry, I will have to interrupt you. So here you are saying that you could indeed, uh, let's say write a DVM or UGK's formulation of pond, but this assumes that adaptive lattices have not already been published in the context of DVM and UGK's, but it has already been published. Well, so as far as I know from uh, the people we are we're working with at the moment, DVM typically has a problem of, of actually finding um, the discrete velocity sets, like you know the scalings that you typically have. And so and this is a non-unique thing and actually problem dependent. I, I'm not talking to... about DBM. I'm to talking about DVM, discrete velocity models, like those used for rare ga rarefied gas flow simulations since the early 2000s. Yeah, what, course, you're talking, what you're talking here is the work by Ai Shu, for example, in China, and this is DPM. This is completely different. Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> there is uh, another question. Uh, how to determine the number of lattice in your model and what is uh, the pr principle? Um, the principle is, uh, at the time being, um, we we kind of use, uh, we kind of stick to nine velocities at the moment, because if that's sufficient, yeah. we typically use a dual population approach in order to impose um, a, variable, a variable adiabatic coefficient. Um, but again, if you, if you want to go to non-equilibrium flows, this will not be sufficient. You will not be able to resolve the shock uh, fully if you stick to nine velocities in particular when, when you're in a co-moving reference frame and then all the velocity is pointing in one direction, you cannot fully resolve the shock that, that will require uh, an higher order lattices in the end. Okay. Okay, so thank you a lot for, the, for this uh, pre 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 presentation. Uh, we don't have uh, a clap uh, since we are still in this uh, strange world uh, made of co COVID uh, and uh, pan pan pandemic stuff, but <laughs> thank you. I can go just for, just, thank you, very just much. for you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now I want to remind to everyone that uh, the conference uh, from now is uh, split in uh, two different sessions. Here uh, we will continue uh, for with the, the third technical session, compressible flows, while uh, in the room Palma uh, now uh, we'll start uh, the uh, fourth technical session about the advanced methods. 
Okay, uh, so now I invite the next speaker. Okay, uh, I can, okay, okay, so the next speaker is uh, uh, Ashan, uh, Ashan Rehanian. Uh, he is uh, from the, 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 the Department of uh, Mechanical and Process Engineering in Zu Zu Zurich. And the title of the presentation is a Particles on Demand for uh, High Mach Number Flows. Please. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, my name is Ehsan, and uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Computational Kinetics Group of Professor Carlin at the ETH University. And today I will be talking about the particles on demand method with the application of highly compressible uh, and high Mac flows. Uh, so, as a brief introduction, the lattice Boltzmann method has been successfully applied uh, in different domains of computational fluid dynamics. Uh, one can exemplify turbulence, multiphase, uh, and despite the uh, the success of lattice Boltzmann in, in these domains, uh, most of the applications so far uh, to date are is still restricted to low max number. Uh, flows. Even if compressible, the range of the max numbers are is still restricted. And uh, all researchers, uh, people are still trying to come up with a simple yet genuine model for uh, with kinetic roots to uh, simulate high mach uh, flows. Uh, and within the uh, framework of uh, kinetic theory, there have been some methods developed uh, so far uh, or with some advantages and disadvantages of their own. But uh, as a recent method, uh, recent and novel method, I, uh, I have chosen the particles on demand method uh, for my research. And today I would like to show some applications of particles on demand on uh, high max number flows. So we had a very uh, comprehensive talk uh, on the introduction of PONT, but a very brief introduction on my side. So uh, in the pond uh, framework, the uh, conventional discrete velocities known as the lattice uh, are rescaled with the local uh, square root of the local temperature of the flow. And this will get rid of the uh, temperature restriction that we have in LVM. And then those velocities are shifted by the local velocity of the flow. And this will give us, uh, bring us the Galilean invariance that we are missing in lattice Boltzmann methods. Uh, so usually in that Boltzmann methods, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, methods to use equilibrium is to uh, is to use the truncated polynomial in velocity, and that can that is the main reason that uh, these schemes are not Galilean invariant. Uh, but here we have an exact equilibrium depending only on the density and the weights, uh, and this will bring us an error-free collision. We also realized that the pond scheme would reduce to lattice Boltzmann if the temperature is simply chosen as the uh, temperature, as the lattice temperature, and if the global reference frame is set to zero. Uh, however, these discrete velocities are no longer integers and space filling, uh, essentially, uh, so that uh, simple point to point streaming that we have in lattice Boltzmann is no longer the case here. And we have to use different methods. For example, I, I use the semi-Lagrangian advection, which will require interpolation. And the way we do that here is, uh, so if we want to uh, update the information at the monitoring point X, we travel back uh, in time uh, through the characteristics where we reach the departure point. And this departure point is, uh, will not be uh, essentially a node point. So some amount of collocation points will be used to interpolate for the desired information. Uh, 
uh, after that, the macroscopic uh, values will be evaluated and we want to iterate this process until the uh, convergence of reference frames are uh, achieved. And at that point, we are sure that we are at the co-moving reference frame where we can use the exact uh, equilibrium uh, function in the collision. And this is the big picture. Now we want to be uh, going to the little detail here as to how we can do all these reconstructions and how they would affect uh, our simulation. So the reconstruction is simply a, a, the interpolation of the transformed particles. We want to transform the populations before uh, using them, before advecting them uh, in order to, to be consistent. So uh, they, they must be transformed to the reference frame of uh, the monitoring point that we want to advect these particles to. Uh, so after transforming those, we want to uh, interpolate these uh, transform particles on all these collocation points. And for the interpolation kernel, well, there are uh, different uh, choices in the literature, which have been extensively used before. Uh, for example, one can use a moment conserving interpolation, where uh, in this scheme, a finite number of moments of the interpolated field, interpolated quality, quantity, sorry, uh, is conserved during this interpolation. Uh, one can use the simple classic Lagrange polynomials, which actually can overlap with this moment conserving at some, under some uh, circumstances. And also we have uh, BS lines, which are smooth functions and so on. So there are so many choices. And, uh, but so if you want to have a compressible flow simulation, uh, if you want to have a high mech flow simulation, we, uh, we will have shocks and discontinuity this is a very classic problem that uh, if we use these interpolation kernels and because they have negative weights, they produce negative weights, uh, the solution will become oscillatory and these oscillations will eventually kill the whole simulation, especially in our scheme that our discrete velocities are the function of uh, square root of temperature. So if these oscillations would, would lead to uh, a negative pressure on temp temperature, then uh, it will essentially, uh, Kill, kill the simulation. So uh, to overcome that, we use two, two, two types of remedies. One is the Venotype interpolation, uh, where we choose between the sub uh, And the other one is to use uh, the total variation diminishing concept, uh, where the total variation of the solution remains finite uh, and not uh, increasing in time. So the Vino interpolation, uh, well, the Vino scheme is a very well known, but just the brief uh, introduction is that uh, the main stencil is broken into uh, different sub stencils and where these uh, sub stencils are assigned, each assigned with a weight. And uh, if a sub stencil would include uh, a discontinuity, then the weight of that sub stencil would be negligible. And finally, the convex combination of solutions at each of the sub stencils will guarantee an oscillationless uh, final solution. Uh, this is one way that we can deal with uh, shocks and discontinuities. The other way that we, uh, we have used is uh, the concept of TVD. And we apply that to an improved well-known BS spline known, known as the K3 BS spline So all BS splines are second order accurate. So, but we can improve those. We can have uh, third order accuracy. And as I said before, the BS plans are smooth functions. They have a continuous derivative. So for example, if we compare this uh, BS plan to the force order Lagrange polynomial, you can see the smoothness of this and the uh, continuous derivative of that uh, in its range. And uh, actually this brings us uh, a very good mass conserving property as we can see in our simulations. So with that in mind, we apply TVD uh, on top of this uh, interpolation kernel uh, to have oscillationless solutions, because as we can see here, uh, we still have temp uh, we still have values below zero that are negative, which will be uh, which will lead to oscillatory solutions. Uh, so, uh, in the following, I will use I will present some benchmarks, classic benchmarks for compressible flows, uh, and. As said before, I will use the uh, Vino and TVDPS line 
uh, schemes. And just for the sake of comparison, I will show uh, a result of uh, Lagrange polynomial force order uh, just to uh, just to show that these polynomials, these uh, simple interpolation kernels, uh, is uh, would not be a good choice, uh, a proper choice in compressible flow simulations as they are oscillatory. Uh, the CFL number is uh, a function of the maximum of the uh, value of the discrete velocity in the whole domain. And uh, in all of the uh, benchmarks, the specific heat is set to 1.4 unless uh, uh, stated otherwise. And to have the specific heat, we simply use the double distribution function method. So first, I would like to show the substruct tube, which is a very mild case uh, in the compressible benchmarks, the CFL is set to 0.4. Uh, we have implemented this problem for with 25 and nine uh, velocities. For example, in this 25, we can see that this uh, red line, which is the force order Lagrange polynomial shows oscillations at the location of the shock. Uh, also, so this is the density and this is the velocity field. These oscillations are also very visible in the velocity at the discontinuity and at, at the shock. Now, this is a very mild case, but these oscillations can actually, so they cannot be tolerated in severe cases, in more extreme cases. And the simulations actually is not possible with, uh, with these uh, simple kernels. But on the other hand, our TBD and Vino scheme gives us a very clean and nice uh, result. Uh, where we have no oscillations on the location of the shock and discontinuity. Uh, and the same explanation goes for the nine velocities as well, where we see that oscillations have been removed uh, from these plots. So I go a little bit further. I show the lag structure problem. The CFL is the same number, 0.4, even though I have uh, compared with lower CFL numbers. Uh, so for example, if you use the force order Lagrange polynomial, this will not work in this uh, problems. And this is even not a very extreme case. So uh, here again, we have, we see that for 25 and nine velocities, uh, location of the shock and discontinuity have been captured well. It is a nice agreement with the uh, exact solution. And more importantly is that uh, the oscillations have been uh, successfully removed uh, from the solution. So if we go a little bit further, we have a max tree shock front interacting with the density, perturbed density field. Uh, so here again, uh, with this CFL number and both nine and 25 velocities, uh, the location of the shock is captured free of oscillations. Also the shocklets and the post-shock waves uh, are captured and they are uh, in good, good agreement with the exact solution. And uh, here we see that with increasing the resolution, we can actually converge to the exact solution. So moving on, this is the last 1D case that I would like to uh, show. So this is the strong shock tube as shown by Benedict. So this problem is strong in the sense that it features a max number of 198. Uh, we fixed the CFL to 0.1 here. Uh, we use nine velocities and we see that the uh, TVD scheme uh, has a very good performance in this uh, problems. Uh, so this is the density and temperature field. And we see that the temperature ratio is 10 to the five, which is far from the performance range of, uh, let's say, lattice Boltzmann methods. Uh, however, on the other hand, the Vino scheme uh, has a slightly poor performance uh, with respect to the TVD. And I, uh, I believe that this is because of the mass conservation problem, because uh, as we know, the semi-Lagrangian schemes are in general not mass conservative. And as I said before, these BS blinds have a very good mass conserving property, which leads to a very good performance, even in these extreme cases. Uh, but this Vino scheme, uh, actually, uh, they do not have this property. And that is why they might uh, diverge a little bit uh, in very extreme cases. But overall, the performance of Vino have been uh, quite good, actually. And for the last test case, the astrophysical jet, uh, which also, which was shown by, uh, sorry, Dr. Uh, Dorschner. Uh, so here, the astrophysical jet is referred to very high speed uh, gas flows, uh, which 
are observed by the Hubble telescope. Uh, and we do not uh, consider the effect of the radioactive cooling, which is actually the case in uh, reality. Uh, so this is, it is conventional to refer to the Mach number with respect to the cold uh, jet. And here the Mach number is 1000. So we fix the CFL to 0.1. We have a different value of gamma here. Uh, so we see that the density and, and the uh, temperature contours here uh, other than the uh, other than the stable solutions, which is actually very important in, in these test cases, because we have a huge uh, amount of kinetic energy, which can uh, simply uh, lead to negative values of temperature, uh, which is uh, again a classic problem in high speed uh, gases. Uh, we see that the general features of a supersonic jet, as uh, for example the bow shock, the uh, instabilities of the jet tip are. Uh, are captured. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, wrap my presentation. So in conclusion, uh, the PON method uses a set of discrete velocities. Uh, and with that, uh, we are given with the Galilean invariance, which we need for high speed uh, simulations. Uh, but of course, when uh, we, we need to augment this method with sh some shock, uh, shock capturing schemes so that we would be enabled to simulate high max number flows. Uh, so, and well, this is still an ongoing research and we are uh, looking forward to extend the application of this model uh, in 3D applications. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, I don't know if there are questions uh, Maybe I have, a, I have a quick question. So thank please, you for your please, presentation. Please, please. Yeah. So you said that your scheme is TVD, right? Yeah. And how can it be TVD if you are not using a Ruge kuta time integration? Uh, so this is a spatial uh, reconstruction. TVD means time. that between two time step, your total variation will not increase. Yeah, that means that you, you also need a proper time integration scheme. Uh, well, I, I can, uh, well, not now, but I can, I have actually tracked the total variation of this scheme. And if it was not TBD, then your solution would be oscillatory, right? No, 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 no. Yes. You are, there is a, the non -oscillatory, oscillatory behavior comes from the Wayno scheme. Sorry, from TVD, what? The Wayno scheme, W E N O. Yeah, I know what is Vino, but Vino is not the only way. So you can use TVD schemes. It is in the literature. It's very classic. Yes, but right. you need a proper time integration scheme yeah, for that. that. That is for the time integration. But no, no, no. if you want a TVD scheme, it's both in space and time. Uh, well, I, I mean, this is basic numerics. Huh? Well, yeah, this is basic CFD, and you can have a spatial reconstruction that are, that is TBD. And if th that was not TBD, all the simulations uh, were not possible. So when you see no oscillations, that so the, uh, the main concept of TBD is to remove the oscillations so that, uh, so that it would change the order of accuracy. It's to not have a uh, local uh, extrema that, that appear. That's the main definition of TPD. Well, I, I refer to local extrema to the literature, yeah. sir. Uh, I, I, have, the literature. I have a question from uh, the chat. Another question. Did you verify yeah. mass conservation in the simulations? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, when we use this uh, uh, BS blowing kernel, we have almost exact conservation of mass, even in very high, uh, in severe cases. It has a very good performance in mass conservation. And that is why we, we chose this uh, kernel uh, and we applied the TBD on top of it. This is a, another interesting question. Uh, and can, also, yeah. Can different particles come to the same point? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Probably it's not uh, uh, in the sense uh, if uh, you can have uh, two different pa particles that come at the same point. I think this is not po po possible if I have understood uh, the me me method in the sense that uh, you I, change I, I, the position. No? 
to match uh, the... I'm not sure if they are talking about, for example, the advection step that uh, we get from different points. So the uh, because the discrete velocities are not symmetric like in the displacement, so we get particles flowing into the monitoring point from different uh, places in space. If that is the question, I'm still not sure that is the right answer. Okay, I think uh, we can move to the next speaker. Okay, uh, so uh, let me invite him. Uh, ecco qua. Okay. Okay, so you can share the screen, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, we can, we can see, okay. The next uh, speaker uh, is Kali Kunis, and uh, the title of the presentation is uh, Dax in uh, uh, Point D, a finite volume implementation of the particles on the mat uh, me method, please. So, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Nikos Kalikunis, and I am a PhD student of Professor Karl Group. My talk today will be about uh, Dax in Pond, or in other words, a finite volume implementation of the particles on demand method. The Lattice Boltzmann method is an accurate and uh, reliable CFD solver. The simple uh, streaming step along the lattice links and the local collision uh, step make LBM a very efficient method competing uh, commercial and other well-established CFD methods. However, at the same time, the lattice puts uh, severe constraints into the attainable flow velocities and temperature ranges. To remedy these uh, constraints, the particles on the one method, or uh, point in short, allows the particles' velocities to be guided by the physics of the flow. Experience with Pond has shown that the operating windows of the kinetic models can be extended uh, considerably, and high-mach uh, compressible flows with large temperature ratios are now possible. As so we already saw, most of the previous works with Pond were designed with a semi-Lagrangian numerical scheme. And although this, simple is, uh, simple, this method is simple and offers uh, several advantages, the main drawback is that it does not allow easily the mass and momentum and energy conservation. And in this work, we wish to address this problem by exploring a finite volume discretization scheme. With this viewpoint, uh, our domain now consists of, of a set of control volumes and uh, cell phases. The key element in this method is the calculation of the fluxes which uh, passes through the uh, cell phases. And since uh, the flux that enters a given cell is identical to that leaving the adjacent volume, these methods are in general uh, conservative. So in this work, we will follow the finite volume implementation of the discrete uh, unified gas kinetic scheme, or uh, DAX in short. And in addition, to the conservative, in addition to the conservative properties of this method, an important characteristic is that the time step is not restricted by the collision time and uh, relatively large CFL numbers can be used for the simulation. So our target is to reformulate the DAX algorithm within a framework of adaptive reference frames in space and time. The underlying uh, kinetic model that is used consists of the two population model. The density and the momentum are uh, conserved from the F populations and the second the, the Gs, they are designed to carry the excess internal energy and to modulate the adiabatic exponent. And again, a brief uh, short uh, overview about the point. So the main idea is that to construct discrete velocities, we need to select a reference frame and we define it using a reference velocity and the reference temperature. In traditional LB models, the reference frame is uh, assumed to be constant across the simulation domain velocity and scaled with the lattice temperature. In point, however, each point in space and time uses its own reference frame, which is characterized by the local flow velocity and temperature, and we term it as the co-moving reference frame. And the key advantage of this approach is that the equilibrium populations in the, in the co-moving reference frame become exact and they do not depend on the velocity. 
For the actual implementation of Bond, the first, the first task is to relate populations at uh, different reference frames. And to accomplish this, we will use the one-to-one -one relation between the population and its vector of moments, also that the moments are independent of the reference frame. Second element, uh, the, the second element that needs to be addressed for the realization of Bond is uh, an iterative scheme, typically a predictor corrector loop that breaks the implicitness. And the reason for this implicitness is that the particle velocities depend on the local flow velocity, which is not known a priori. Now we'll explain the basic steps of the DAX and the finite volume discretization, focusing for simplicity on the F populations. The same procedure that will be outlined here is uh, also holds for the second population. The starting point of the analysis is the continuous uh, BGK equation. We integrate spatially over a cell and a long time, using the midpoint rule for the convection term and the trapezoidal rule for the collision term. After the integration, we arrive at the following discrete equation, where now the Fs are the cell average population, and the capital Fis designate the population flux over the cell phases. And we notice that uh, this equation is uh, implicit due to the collision term on the right-hand side. To avoid the implicitness, we use the following variable transformation, which is also incorporated in the standard LB formulation. Substituting the new populations, we arrive at our final equation, which is used to update the populations in the cell. The alpha and beta coefficients depend on the time step and the relaxation time in a similar fashion as LBM. The main difficulty here in this equation is the calculation of the fluxes. So let's see how we evaluate them. Uh, let's focus on this simplified uh, diagram. The horizontal axis repre represents the space with the solid cubes showing the cell centers. Time step n, we know the populations at the centers and, uh, and what we need in order to evaluate the fluxes are the, are, the, are the populations at the faces of the cells and time step n plus a half. And to compute these populations, we essentially apply a half time step uh, LB step. And to perform this explicitly, we again use uh, the variable transformation as uh, shown by the populations with the overbar. The flux evaluation can be sum summarized in the following uh, steps. So first, compute the transformed pop populations at the cell centers and the spatial gradients. And for high map flows with uh, discontinuities, Slope limiters, uh, such as uh, the Van Leer limiter, are, they are used for the gradient computation. We then perform the pond uh, streaming step. So the reference frame is uh, initialized with the flow fields from the, previous, uh, from the previous time step, and we calculate the departure point. Using the cell centers data and the spatial gradients, we can uh, li linearly reconstruct the populations at the departure point. And uh, with uh, the populations calculated, the flow fields at the cell faces are now evaluated and uh, the loop is uh, repeated until the reference frame converges. And at the end of this step, we use the transformation to obtain the F populations and evaluate the fluxes. We should also note that uh, at this point, if, if instead of the on the iterations, we use a constant reference frame and uh, just a linear reconstruction of the departure point, we retrieve also the original DAX algorithm. So now we can show an overview of the pond dax algorithm, identifying the following uh, phases. At the beginning of the time step, we have the populations and the flow fields uh, defined at the cell centers. So with this input, we can uh, calculate the transformed uh, populations, the F bar, and the spatial uh, gradients at each cell center. So the second phase consists of the flux uh, evaluation at every cell phase. And this is the phase where uh, the bond iterations uh, take place. And at the final phase, we update the populations at each cell center using the fluxes from the previous phase and uh, calculate the flow fields. We proceed now to the validation of the, of the scheme, starting with a classical benchmark of the short shock tube. So the velocity set is the D2Q9, the adiabatic exponent set 1.4, and the CFL number is set to 0 0.4. And with this uh, imposed initial conditions, 
This case corresponds to an initial pressure ratio of 10 across the middle of the tube. The figures below show the density, the velocity, and the pressure profiles superimposed with an analytical solution, the exact solution. And we can see that the results in general are very, very well with the reference, with the reference uh, solutions with a very, very small degree of oscillation. The next case is the LAX uh, shock tube, which we simulate with a D2 Q25 and with the same simulation parameters. So the Mach number for this case is greater than the previous. And uh, in general, it's a more challenging uh, simulation of the shock than the shock tube. But again, we, we observe that the profiles match uh, very well with the reference solutions, again, with uh, only a very small degree of uh, oscillation. The last uh, 1D validation case is the Schwasser problem. In this uh, problem, the, the shock wave of Mach 3 interacts with a perturbed density field, leading to, leading to discontinuities and uh, small structures. The simulation is uh, set with CFL number to 0 0.2, and the domain is discretized with uh, 800 points. The left diagram shows the initial conditions for the density profile, while the right uh, diagram shows the final results. And we can see that the shock uh, locations uh, are captured very well, and also that the small uh, structures agree very well with the reference solution. The next problem to study is a 2D Riemann problem, which is uh, also a benchmark test case for compressible solvers. The model consists of the D2Q9 set with a CFL number set to 0 0.3. The simulation is uh, initialized by dividing the domain into four quadrants, each of which is set to constant values of flow fees, as shown in the configuration on the right. For boundary conditions, we apply zero gradient at the populations at each boundary of the domain. And what we expect to see from this setup are emanating shock waves from the interfaces, propagating towards the upper right corner, and the development of small structures due to the interaction of the waves near the middle. So here we can see the results for the density profile for three different uh, resolutions. And also on the bottom row, we can see a zoom in uh, towards the center of the domain of density contours. And in all cases, we see the propagation towards uh, the right uh, upper corner, as well as the development of uh, finer structures with uh, increasing res resolution. And uh, in general, these uh, results match very well the corresponding results from the literature. The final case is a 2D HIMACH jet flow, which is uh, being injected into the domain, which is initially full of uh, gas at rest. At the inlet, we impose uh, a Mach number of uh, 50, and uh, zero gradient uh, boundary conditions are applied to the rest of the boundaries. The velocity set is the D2Q9 and CFL number to 0 0.2. And here in the two figures, you can see the results for the density and the pressure profiles where we see the shock propagating into the medium. And also, we, we can notice the large uh, ratios between minimum and maximum uh, pressure more than two orders of uh, magnitude. So in conclusion, the particles on demand uh, method was uh, tested with a finite volume discretization, in particular, the discrete unified gas kinetic scheme, which is a conservative uh, formulation. The DAX, uh, the POMP DAX scheme was also validated with a series of 1D and 2D problems, showing a very good agreement with uh, the benchmarks. In general, uh, using an adaptive reference frame uh, formulation in DAX, uh, it, is, it shows a considerable uh, improvement of the operating range of the kinetic models, uh, similar with uh, what we have seen with other POMP methods. And finally, more, more work will be pursued on the flux evaluation and the spatial reconstruction further testing on more demanding uh, cases and also 3D problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, pre presentation. If there are questions, I think there is already one, the first. Okay. In the chat. Oh, oops, oops. So this, uh, this method is uh, second order, both in uh, space and time. From what they did, Okay, quest. Yeah. So the viscosity, uh, we, you, you set the viscosity through the relaxation parameter. Okay. In general, no, it does not depend on the propagation method. And uh, let me read the other one. 
Okay, the second uh, adaptive uh, UGKS yeah, that... have uh, already been published in the past. Mm -hmm. How does your approach compare with these approaches in terms of accuracy, robustness, and efficiency? So this, uh, this work here, what we show, uh, so, so it's the implementation of the Ponda ideas into this finite volume uh, method. So, of course, the, uh, the ideas of adaptive reference frame we know from the past, but the main uh, attribute of Pond is uh, how you can uh, formulate this idea into the LB setting. So through the iterations and through the moment matching. So in general, it's, uh, it's a quite fresh work. So we are now investigating into the, uh, into the trends of the, of the scheme, which uh, up to now has shown quite uh, positive results, but we're still in an initial phase of development. So I could not now comment on the comparison, uh, but we, we definitely have seen an improvement of, uh, let's say, the original DAX uh, compared to Pond and DAX. Uh, if I may, I have another question. Yeah, could, okay, please. Could you come back on the slides where you showed the third shock tube with the D2Q9? Because I think that you forgot to say something here. You are using top, two populations, right? So the one before this one. Ah, so yeah, yeah. right. You are using two population, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, because if you use only one population, uh, you since you do not have the right third order moment, you will have a mismatch oh, no, on the on everywhere the temperature we, field. Uh, sorry, everywhere we use the two population model. Yeah, but you, yeah, that's the trick, in fact, because if you were using one population, since you have been saying for like three talks that with the Q9 formulation, it works, it doesn't work. You do not have the right uh, third order moment. And this can be easily shown, in fact. But in the common reference frame, also the third moment is... Uh, so if you compute... Did, did, did you moment. compute the deviation with respect to the third order moment? And did you show that it is equal to machine precision, the error? You can compute, yes, yeah, so the third moment and the fourth, so in the co-moving reference frame only, it is... Uh... Well, I mean, this is extremely weird because we implemented it and we have issues on the temperature field and we showed that it's because of the third order moment. In fact, it's in the backup slides of my presentation of yesterday. This can be easily checked on ResearchGate. I just uploaded it. So you can also check our paper. So we yeah, in the paper you use two population. If you use two population, mm -hmm. that means that you are dividing the resolution of mass and momentum equation from temperature. And for mass and momentum equation, you need up to second order moments for the convective fluxes. So Q9 works. But if you want further to do all the physics with Q9, then you need third order moments. And this doesn't work because you do not have enough moments with the Q9 formulation. You only have nine moments because there is a direct bijection between the velocity space and the moment space. So, but uh, so you have a mistake in your thinking because the whole concept of point, if you, if you go on paper and- uh, No, but this is basic mathematics, huh? Did you, you compute, compute, did you compute by hand the third order moment in the uh, commoving reference frame? And did you show that you get the right one? Yes, so you can, you can also- Yes, which paper? The third, the, the third which paper? order moment. I want to see the paper. Which the multi, paper? multi-scale. No, multi-scale, multi -scale. you have two populations. Don't lie. No. But you can still see the, the equilibrium moment using the D229 only there. So you are saying on record, you compute, you compute are, you saying, are you saying on record that using one population, nine velocities, you do not have any issue with the third order moment? So what I'm saying, is that at the, with the co-moving reference frame? So only when you have the co-moving reference frame, then the the third order third order moment is uh, the correct one. But only if you use the co-moving reference frame. And this is why with, with, with one population. Also, also with or if you just compute with with one population with nine velocities. So I think we got the point uh, about uh, one or two populations. Yeah, so with at the, least if, if you consider just one population, and if it, you compute the, okay. the third... It, it is clear the question and, uh, and, uh, and the answer. I don't want to, uh, uh, how you say, give a pen penalty to the pe people that do question uh, 
through the through the chat there is a, a comment by Irina mm -hmm. uh, she wrote also the UGKS scheme of uh, of XU is a fully Eulerian, while this formulation has an half step of uh, Lagrangian stre streaming. Uh, that's that's correct. Uh, and the, the DAX is in general a combination between uh, U unified gas kinetics and LBM. So it's, uh, it's, it's a, uni a unison between these two methods. So this is why the half time uh, Lagrangian streaming enters the game in this formulation. Uh, that's okay. It. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again. And uh, I think now uh, we have a coffee break of 20 minutes. So uh, we will see later at uh, 11 and 20. Thank you very much. And have a good coffee break. <laughs>